first, folks, thank you so much for doing this interview with me. But more importantly, thank you so much for being part of such an amazing project that I had a chance to see. Uh, Maria, I'm going to jump right over to you. What was the inspiration in being able to create this? Because like I said, uh, for me watching this, it was emotional. It was a learning experience. It was things that I've heard about, but being able to see it actually being depicted I thought was so important. Again, what was the inspiration in putting this together? Um, I, I think mostly for me and, and so many people that stood by me was that it hadn't uh, ever really been done before. And it was really looking at a multi-generational way uh, to look at the residential school experience uh, through one family and for people to understand uh, the kind of domino effect it had um, in our families that is still continuing. Uh, but, uh, you know, the big part of it really was to look at the resilience uh, of our families and and how we got to be where we are today. It's not just that, too, Marie. Um, I, it was funny. We was talking off camera to a couple of other folks from CBC. And one of the things that, I, you know, I come from the 70s and 80s growing up and, you know, I did graduate and, you know, I got my marks for history. I feel like I never knew what history was all about, period. It's only been when I got to my 20s and even coming up to now, I'm still learning about history. And I feel like what you've been able to put together, this is a part of history that I would never have learned growing up. And I feel like it's so important that the generations of today learn because this is actual Canadian history. Absolutely. And I, I think, you know, what we can say straight off is is uh, what you just said and what, what I experienced going to school also. I mean, I didn't learn about residential school experience in school, um, not in elementary, not in high school, not even in university. So in some ways, you know, this history, which is our shared history, has been kept from us uh, for such a long time. And, you know, even in Indigenous families, you know, we're reclaiming um, our families, reclaiming our history, the true history, uh, and what, what that meant to us and, and how it affected, you know, so many generations and, and really what it looks like to um, look it in the face and, and to be truthful about it and also to create a dialogue around it that maybe we haven't been able to have before. I'm going to ask you one more, another question, Maria, and then Grace, I'm going to go to you. For folks who don't know, what is this story about? Because it's not just a story. There are several different stories. In fact, uh, for this, each chapter has several different stories. It talks about the present, the past, and the future. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's, it's centered around Grace's character, Aline Spears, who's a, a Cree matriarch who goes into World War II as a code talker and falls in love with this beautiful Indigenous man from the West Coast. And they, you know, they plan on having a family um, and their experience in residential school comes back to them. So we can kind of see, you know, through there, just trying to fight so hard, you know, to bring their children up uh, in a way that that is um, like all of us, you know, we're just fighting so hard for, to build a path for our kids. Um, we can st start to see that they're being, you know, they're being, I don't know, that that this experience that they both had as children in residential school comes back to them. And so we really see them as modern people uh, in their present. We see them fighting for a future that they knew was theirs, while also having to deal with the, you know, what happened to them as children and how that affects their family and their family's family. So it really not only looks, it's a personal story, I, I believe it's a very, it's a family story, but it also looks at history and how politics um, and, and uh, I guess just to say a genocide, how that played out in a personal way uh, in this country. Absolutely. Grace, uh, your character, what is it like to play your uh, your character? Because such a strong woman, but at the same time, knowing what she went through as a child what was it like for you to play that character and going through the emotions and going back and forth and plus can you talk about the younger you the actress and what was it like to watch her play your same character I'll, I'll start with summer um who played the younger version 
I adore her. I think of her as a sister. Uh, she is so incredible. She's who I wanted to be when I was young. I wanted to be an actor when I was very young. And my dad, uh, who's a retired school teacher, asked me to graduate from high school first before I got into Hollywood, before I moved to Los Angeles. So Summer is who I wanted to be, but we foster her. We, we take care of her. We lift her up. And that's how the industry has changed is because now these young actors that Marie hires, that they bring on, that we can take care of them. And that's who I wanted to be, but I didn't have Marie when I was a kid. I didn't have female indigenous directors lifting me up and creating safe spaces. So I'm, I'm so proud of her because I see myself in her and I, I, I like, if you look at our two faces, we look so similar. Like it's so beautiful. And, and, and her family is so supportive of her and she's carrying all this weight. Like she, I've seen her in the last uh, couple months since shooting a few years ago and she looks different. Mm -hmm. And I worry and I love her, but I hope she's not taking on too much. Do you know what I mean? Because Marie's taken on so much. I take that on and I hope Summer's not taking on too much still be a child but I think when it comes to indigenous peoples we grow up too fast I I always felt like I was an adult when I was very young and I couldn't wait to get older I couldn't wait to leave home I couldn't wait to become an actress and now that I'm here I'm like oh I never had the childhood I never had that so it's tragedy but that's also what Aline had and, and that's her story is that she never had a chance to be free until the very end when she mic drops and, and walks away from these colonizers and people who are holding her down. She finally finds her power. And that's what's so beautiful about the series is that we see her finally feel young again. And I feel that way too. I, I'm. I've never felt younger. And I think that has something to say about trauma and dealing with what we've gone through and shedding layers. And that's what my work does. Did you know how to speak Cree before this? Because, and uh, Maria, I want to talk to you about this because I think this is probably the most beautiful things about mm -hmm. the series. Mm -hmm. The fact that you speak back and forth. Did you already know how to speak Cree? If not, did you learn it? And if so, what did it feel to be able to represent that part of this great series? I've struggled so much because every role I do, there's always an indigenous uh, language aspect. I'm like, oh gosh, I don't even know my own language. And I've learned Cree, I've learned Heisla, I've learned Haida, I've learned Anishinaabe. I've, I've learned so many languages, but that's what the role you know, asks for. And Marie and our producers at Screen Siren, and they they brought in um, language coaches. So I'm I'm texting, calling, always learning. You know, for one line in English, I can learn it in two seconds. In Cree, it's two hours, and you just repeat it and you repeat it. I just go on walks. I just listen to language. So we did like. Um, breakdowns where coaches would send me elders, free elders would send me breakdowns of the language. And it takes so much time, but that's also so important to give back to the community and to know that I'm representing them in a good way. But it, it's so incredibly challenging um, for everyone on board to, to have, and, but, but look at the younger version and the older version of me, they both did it too. So it's, it's really, it's just one of those things that we have to do to respect the people that um, are from the land that we're telling. Absolutely. Marie, I'm going to go back to you because like I said, I thought that was the most beautiful part of this was the fact that uh, we go back and forth there. There's English. Yes, there is some French. But yeah. free is represented in a normal conversation. And when I talked about earlier about history, honest to God, I wish when I was back in school, they teach us, you know, English, they teach us French. Why couldn't they teach us an indigenous, indigenous language also as a class? That's what made me uh, really think about this when I saw 
watching this series. Yeah. Yeah, it's just, uh, you know, like it's it's a real uh, responsibility, but a real honor to to hear the language of where that story comes, where the people come from that land. And that land has a language. It has a rhythm. It has a point of view. It has poetry um, and it's distinct from each other. So I think, you know, there's many times on set when language is brought in and Grace is right. You know, we're all, you know, a little bit scared because we we need to do it the right way. Um, but it's also, there's this thing that happens. It's very emotional, you know, that you, you sometimes forget that to hear someone's language, um, and hear it spoken, uh, and hear it spoken between people that love each other on the land that is theirs. It's so emotional. And I, I think it's cause, you know, we've had to fight really hard, uh, to hold on to languages and we've had all our peoples have had to fight really hard to reclaim it, you know, to reclaim it, what was rightfully theirs. Yeah. Grace, what would you say was the most emotional um, uh, scene for you to play? Uh, I, I mentioned it before, and I don't want to trigger anyone, but uh, mm -hmm. my first day was when I lose my partner. And it was very hard for me because suicide is such a big part of our communities and indigenous youth. And I have, I have a few friends who have passed. And so that is so difficult, but then you go to the other side and intimacy is still hard for me. So then to the next day, fall in love with my husband and have to kiss and, and be in you know each other's arms, that's still hard for us too. And it all comes back to residential schools and what they did to us and they, they didn't, they took us from our families and they didn't let us experience love. And I know Marie talks about this a lot is that we never got to experience love, whether that's your parents embracing you. We didn't have them. We were taken. We didn't, we don't, we, we are still broken in certain generations because of the lack of touch of, of just having that intimacy. So it's like, there's the trauma and then there's the love side and both are just as difficult, which is so wild to me as a modern indigenous Sequat woman to, to realize I'm still struggling with both, you know, loss and love. Murray, if the stories that did not come out in the news of the, the grave sites, mm -hmm. and if we didn't have the pandemic happen and the things that we saw in the U.S. and in Canada, do you believe that this could have been made? I mean, I keep thinking to myself, back in the 70s, I remember watching Roots and how big it was and things like that. But I could never think in the 70s something like this would have been made back then in Canada. Yeah, I mean, I'm still, you know, obviously privileged to have been, you know, uh, inside Bones of Crows and have made it with, with you know, this outstanding uh, creative force that we all were, but, um, you know, I don't even know if it would have been done five years ago, you know? I mean, I remember watching Roots as a kid and just kind of just paralyzed by, by what I didn't know and what I should have known, what I could have known, how people can do that to other people um, and how people can survive you know, almost anything. So it just had so many emotions um, watching it um, as a kid that stayed with me because I was also just um, amazed that that people could tell their story, you know, that they could be listened to and heard. And I did think it changed, you know, it, it obviously it didn't change enough or as much as we all wanted, but it did change things. And I, and I hope, you know, I hope that for Bones of Crows and I hope that for all you know, all our filmmakers and storytellers that the, the truth can change things because um, we're hoping human beings can feel, um, can understand uh, what is real and what isn't and want to engage in a dialogue that is not just one-sided, so. Amen to that, folks. Thank you so much, not just for this interview, but for such a great television um historical event and i'm going to use that word as an event because i want people to take it as that because it needs to be seen it needs to be heard and it needs to be discussed and i was saying off camera too that i hope once 
everybody's seen all the parts to this. I hope there is a discussion with people on this um, because that, 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 that's the goal is that I just want people to go home for Thanksgiving and chat with families yeah. and say, did you know this happened on, on the land we live on? And, and that's the beginning. This is the seed we are planting with Bones of Crows. It's a seed. And I hope that we all kind of take that. Again, amen to that. Folks, thank you so much. And I hope somewhere on the red carpet, I get to run into both of you. Thanks again. Thank you so much. Thank you.